Well, good morning, church. You doing all right? Hey, okay. If you're a guest with us today, or if you haven't been here in a while, it's your first time in a few weeks, let me just kind of catch you up on what's happening here. So we're in week four of a six-week series we've just called Core Values. So if you look in your, uh, in your seat somewhere around you, you should have a card. looks like this. Uh, these are our, our values. And, and on the back, they're, 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 here they are again. They're defined for you. There's a little code you can scan to get more resources. And our goal in this series is just kind of to lay before you the, the five values, or if that sounds too corporate America, that the five family traits that, that we want to be committed to as as a faith family here at Forest Lake, that, that when, when you take our, our church and put it under a microscope, the DNA of our church are these five values. So, so last week we said we're committed to missions. Or two weeks ago we said we're committed to missions. And what we mean by that is we're committed to, to declaring and demonstrating here and around the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that's missions, and we're committed. Last week we said we're committed to discipleship. That means we're committed to helping and equipping and challenging every single person in this room who's a follower of Christ to become a disciple maker. So this week, our, our third value we're looking at is service. That's the value we need to chat about this morning. Now, when it comes to service, this idea of serving one another, here's what we mean by it. We mean we're committed to meeting the needs of those around us, both in our faith family, that those in this room who are part of our faith family here, and in our neighborhoods where you live and I live. Okay, so when we talk about service, that's what we're committed to. Now, when it comes to service, this idea of serving one another, it's not a distinctively Christian idea, right? It's not just something that only Christians can do, serving other people. So last, last week, took a vacation to Orange Beach with uh, Jacqueline and her family. There's about 20 of us. And we, uh, we, we ended up we're trying to go to dinner with 18 people in, in the middle of June in Orange Beach. is insane. I don't know why we tried to do that. But we tried to go. First place we went, it's gonna, they, they said, we don't even want you. There's too many people. We don't have enough staff. Please go somewhere else. So we did. We tried Lulu's, like a four-hour wait. We got like 10 kids. Are you serious? Who's, who's, who's waiting four hours to eat at Lulu's? Isn't even that good. So we ended up at Lambert's. And all God's people said... Amen, baby. You know about Lambert's? Come on, dude. Lambert's is amazing. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever been to Lambert's, but, but not only, I mean, I love that place. Not, I mean, I don't just love the fact that they throw pumpkin-sized rolls at your face. Whether you're four or 40, they're just chunking them. I, I, I love the fact that, that at any given moment, somebody's carrying around a five-gallon bucket of who knows what, but I want it. It could be fried okra, collards, mat, whatever it is, they're just going to sop it on your plate. Yes, please. But what I love the most about Lambert's, at least this trip, was the service. I mean, I don't know about your experience, but, but I've never had bad service at Lambert's. Maybe you have. I haven't. This time we took a group of 18, about 18 people, had 10 kids. We showed up. They said it's going to be about an hour and a half which with 10 kids felt like eight hours. But once we finally got into the restaurant, man, it was just good. The food, I mean, the drinks, they got the drinks right. The food was, was right and hot when it came out. They got us our check right when we wanted it, just, just as the kids were going insane. And we, fought, we got in and out in basically an hour, no issues, good service, amazing food. Everything about that experience just said, hey, we know how to do service here at Lambert's. Right? So serving one another is not just a Christian thing. But if that's true, then the question we've got to ask ourselves is this. What is it about the kind of service that, that the Scriptures call us to that makes it unique and distinct from, all the, from, from the server who's going to take your order at lunch today? Or from the customer service rep at AT&T that you're going to lay into this week? Or, or the, the men and women volunteering at shelters, whether the homeless shelters, and whatever it is, what makes the kind of service we're called to do distinct from the other kinds of service that we encounter every day? I'm glad you asked that question, because that's what's next in my notes. The scriptures actually answer that question for us. And what I think is one of the most mind-blowing scenes in the Bible. If you know your Bible, you know what scene I'm talking about. If you don't, let me show it 
to you. John chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, John 13 is where we'll be. Well, it's, it's, toward, it's about just past halfway. If you hit the maps, you've gone too far. So John chapter 13, we'll start in verse 1 and read through verse 16. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a hardback maroon one on the back of the seat in front of you. If, if you don't own one, take that. That's our gift. If you just want to read along, I always want you to see, I'm not making anything up here. This story sounds crazy. actually happened. It's in the Bible. It's in John chapter 13. So let me encourage you to, to grab your copy of God's Word. We'll look at, we'll look at this together. As you're turning there, let, let me just say welcome. My name is Patrick. It's great to have you here at Forest Lake in worship this morning. John 13, and what's about to happen here, Jesus Christ, who, who is, is the creator and sustainer of the universe in the flesh, is just a couple of days away from being falsely accused by Roman and Jewish authorities, from, from being falsely tried in a sham trial, from, from being wrongly accused as guilty, from being beaten to within an inch of his life, and then slung up on a cross where he'll have nails pummeled into his hands and feet. So that, that's where he knows he's headed, which creates a sense of urgency in the story we're about to read. So if, if, if Jesus knows that in just a few short hours, I'm going to be dead and then resurrected and then 40 days later leave this place, go back to my father's right hand. What do I want to show my disciples? What's most important to illustrate for my followers before I leave? So with that grid in our minds, John chapter 13, we'll pick it up in verse 1. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my head and my hands. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet. He is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. So he washes the feet of the man who's going to betray him to death. Verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, the important verse here, underline it, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I've done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you do, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Okay, so at this point in the gospel, Jesus knows he's headed for the cross. But before he, before he goes there, he, he models for us what biblical service ought to look like, what it ought to look like for us as followers of Jesus to meet the needs of those around us. Like what, is, what does it look like? What does it mean? What is Christian service all about? How are we to serve in a way that looks noticeably different from the other ways of service you'll encounter this week. So the kind of service that Jesus lays before us has, has three elements here. I want to show them to you. So there's my outline. Here it is. If you're type A, breathe out. Here's the outline. We, we are called to serve counterculturally, sacrificially, and selflessly. 
We're called to serve counterculturally, sacrificially, and selflessly. And all I want to do for the next few moments is kind of unpack that sentence for you. So, so let's look at the first kind of service Jesus models for us here in John 13. The first thing we pick up from this picture of service is that we're called to serve counterculturally. Let me try to paint the picture of, of just how, how countercultural Jesus, who, who's not just a first century Jewish rabbi who would never have washed his disciples' feet, but he's also the son of the living God. How countercultural his washing his disciples' feet is without getting as graphic as I really need to. Just think about how, how disgusting feet are today. Right? Just think about how, how gross feet, would you just walk up to my feet and wash my feet? I wouldn't encourage that. Give me, give me, let me get a shower first. Think about how gross feet are today. Multiply that times a billion, and you're still not there. And yet, Christ, the Son of God, takes off his coat, his outer garment, wraps it around, wraps a towel around his waist, pours water in a basin, and washes the muck and mire off of these men's disgusting feet. We don't, we don't, we don't really have a cultural equivalent of what Jesus is doing here, just, just how counter-cultural, how radical it would have been. But I came across this illustration today, uh, this week, and I think it'll help us. Well, think of someone who's, like, who's well beyond you in power, well beyond you in, in wealth, well beyond you in status and fame. Think, think of that person, whoever it is for you. Maybe, it's a, maybe for you it's, a, it's an actor or a musician. Maybe for you it's a professional athlete. Maybe it's somebody in public office. Whoever that, that guy or girl is, that, that's kind of your, the person you, you think about is wealthy and powerful and famous. Get it in your mind. You got it? Okay, now... Think of, imagine this scene. They come to your house for dinner tonight. Everything goes well. Everything's totally normal. After dinner, though, they, they take off their dinner coat, put it on the chair, and then they, they actually head upstairs into your bathroom and just start scrubbing your toilet. Are you not going to go, what, what are you doing? Like, what, what, why are you in here? What are you, they're going to go, who can't aim? How hard is this? It's not difficult. It's right here. What's your, and you're going to go, why are you, this is not right. You shouldn't be, I should be doing this for you, not you for me. And you're just not going to be able to pull them off of them cleaning the most disgusting area of your house. Maybe for you it's not your bathroom, maybe for you it's, maybe for you it's your, your closet or your kitchen, whatever the disgusting place in your house is, that's where they're going to clean up the disgusting muck and mire. That's why Peter says in verse 7, or verse 6, what are you doing? Are you going to wash my feet? They're making these, why are you doing that? This is wrong. And that culture made no sense. It was actually scandalous for him to do that. But that's what's happening in this moment. Jesus who is well beyond all of these men and everyone in this room, in power, authority, influence, doesn't wield it like a sword. He wields it like a servant. He stoops to the lowest rung on the social ladder to serve these men by washing their feet. And, and here's what he's doing when he's doing that. He's saying, look, Christians, if you want to make me look really good, then you're going to need to serve in a way that looks radically counter-cultural to the people around you. That, that's the first picture that we get here of a biblical service. What does Christ call us to when he calls us to serve? He calls us to serve counter-culturally. Second, he calls us to serve sacrificially. Serve sacrificially. See, what Jesus is doing when he shows his disciples here, even though they don't quite get it in the moment, especially our boy Peter, is that the kind of service he's calling them to will require sacrifice. It's going to cost you something. It's going to require you to give some things up. It's going to require you to not always get your way. It's going to require you to let go of some things. See, in the end, get this, in the end, yes, this text is about foot washing. But it's not ultimately about foot washing. 
Are you tracking with that? So what Jesus is doing here is he's using this example of washing their disgusting feet, this sacrificial act of foot washing to illustrate and ultimately point to the ultimate sacrificial way to serve these men and everyone in all of history. Not by washing feet, but by shedding his blood. See, a couple of days later, Jesus, after washing his disciples' feet, fast forward two days, will be hung on a cross, and within six hours, will be dead, despite the fact that he was completely innocent. Why do you do that? To reconcile you and me to him. If you put your faith in him. See, see, ultimately, this is not just about foot washing. This is about sacrifice. This is Jesus saying, if, if you want to push back darkness, you want to model biblical service, it's going to cost you something. And he models that by giving up the ultimate sacrifice, his own life, so that you and I, guilty, wicked, sinful as we can be, might, if we put our faith in him, be reconciled to God forever. That's the foundation and motivation of service. Right, that Christ laid down his own life so that we might follow, verse 16, his example. So it's going to cost something if you want to serve in the kingdom. And if you've ever served in kids' ministry, you know that. It's going to cost, if you've ever served on a praise team, you know that. you ever led Bible study, you know that. Served AV, you know that. It's going to cost you something. And that might sound like bad news, but here's why it's good news. Because in stepping into sacrificial service, we're walking in obedience to the kind of life Christ has designed us to walk in. And when you walk in obedience, there's joy. And all of us are serious about our joy. So the invitation here is to serve sacrificially. The third way we see the service, the, the, the biblical service modeled here is we, we call it to serve selflessly. Not just counter-culturally, not just sacrificially, but selflessly. I don't know if there's a clearer picture of what it looks like to serve selflessly than what Jesus does here in John 13. This is Jesus, not just some, some normal dude in the first century, the Son of God who's staring down a gruesome, graphic, horrible, brutal, bloody death. And in this moment, I don't know about you, but I'll just be concerned about me. But what, is, what does he do? Notice what his play is. His play is to say in this moment, with the cross before me, I'm washing your feet because your needs are more important than mine. And, and just hours before he's beaten and murdered, he's concerned to meet their needs more than his own. Like serving other people is more important than serving self to him in this moment. I don't know about you, but, but just serving selflessly doesn't come easy and natural to me. Anybody else? That's just kind of not my default mode is I'd rather serve you than me. Most days that's just not true. You know why? Because I love me. I love me some me. And so when I, when I, when I have a choice, most days serve you, serve me, my knee-jerk reaction is I'll serve me and then we might get to you. But what Christ is saying here is that's not the way the kingdom works. You serve others at the expense of serving yourself. So I told you last week we went to Lambert's. And it was about an hour and a half wait to get in there to that promised land. And once we got in and sat down, everything was cool. But, but in the hour and a half that we were waiting, I, I don't know about you, but I, I just could feel myself. We had two hungry, whiny kids, one hungry, whiny adult. That was me. And we're just sitting there. And we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's, it's like 8 billion degrees. I'm sweating like crazy. I'm hungry as all get out. I just found myself start to reach a breaking point. You ever been there? And I'm waiting and waiting to eat somewhere. I just felt myself not just hangry. We're way past hangry. It's like demonic. So I just found myself going insane. And I found myself actually just getting more and more annoyed as more people showed up to eat there. Right? I just thought, what are you doing here? I've got kids that are hungry. I'm hungry. We've been waiting here for two hours. Out of all the places in Orange Beach, you're going to eat here? I know you got kids. To, I'm, you got kids that are hungry too. You got a family to feed, but I do too. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm hot. 
I'm sweating. I want to get out of here. And you came to eat here? Are you kidding me? Like, what is that other than maybe you're important, but I'm most important? What is that other than you have some needs, but mine are more important than yours? So that's what I'm about, meeting my needs first. And how, how wicked is that? How upside down is that from what Christ has called us to do? Here's the kind of service Christ calls us to, Philippians 2, 3. Get this. Hear this. It's going to be hard for us. Do nothing. Nothing. Nothing, including waiting to eat at Lambert's out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, what? Consider others as more important than yourselves. That's not the culture we live in, is it? Our culture is, you're awesome, you're the point, you're the center of the universe, you're the only one who should ever eat at Lambert's. That's our culture, and that's what Christ is saying. We've got to be done with that. If we're going to step into biblical service, we've got to serve selflessly. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it costs. Yes, it's sacrificial. Yes, it's countercultural. But that's the kind of service Christ calls us to. So, if that's what gospel-motivated, Christ-centered biblical service looks like, Right, countercultural, sacrificial, selfless. Here's the question we've got to answer. And, and I hope you're asking this question. What does this look like, like on the ground? What, what I mean by that is what is, this, what, is, what is serving in this way supposed to look like in your life this week? Okay, let me give you just a couple of, of suggestions here, a couple of encouragements. This is application, first point. View your daily interactions with people as opportunities to serve. Let me say that. That's so simple. I need to say it again. View your daily interactions with people as opportunities to serve. So for most of us, this is going to work itself out in concentric, in concentric circles, right? So, so for me, this is going to start with my wife, meeting the needs of my wife. If you're not married, then it'll be your roommate. If you don't have a roommate, then whoever you most closely and consistently do life with, that's where you start. So to make it simple, when I walk in the house and there's dishes piled up in the sink and Cheerios are everywhere and toys are on top of the bookcase, I know something's happened in this house that, that's made somebody lost their mind. Could be kids, could be Jacqueline, somebody went insane today. And so rather than me grab a, grab a glass of tea, which just dirties another dish and plop down on the recliner, I, I need to step in and serve. I need to step in, knock out the dishes and, and pick up the Cheerios, calm the kids down, get them out of that. Do something to help, to meet needs. And do, do I want to do dishes every time I come home? No. Doing dishes is like the worst chore. I'd rather scrub our baseboards with a toothbrush than do the dishes. But it's not about me. But it's not about me saying, oh, well, that's Jacqueline's job. She's supposed to do the dishes and, and keep the house clean. Come on, bro. Why, why don't you do a countercultural thing and step in and serve your wife? Serve your spouse, serve your roommate, serve whoever you do life most closely and consistently with. And that's going to make Christ look really good. The next circle is, is kids. Next circle is neighbors. So Jacqueline and I always want to, to ask this question. How can we serve our neighbors who live around us? We live right over here, just like you could throw a rock and, and, get, get, and hit us in the head. With, so we live right over there. And, and all in this, in this neighborhood are college students. So we want to ask, how can we serve our neighbor? How can we serve students? So for us, it's just very simple stuff. Like occasionally, well, I'll just go buy some, ten, some $10 Target gift cards. And just around finals week, just go drop them in mailboxes. Is that illegal? Probably so, but I do it anyway. So I want to serve. That's simple. It's easy. They, they, want, they need stuff from Target, like, like candy and energy drinks and whatever. So I just want to bless them with, 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 with Target gift cards. Or maybe it's just saying, Hey, they've got car trouble. I know nothing about cars. I'll pray over you, though, and I'll call somebody who does know about cars. That's just me easily serving. Or maybe it's, it's us saying, hey, is there any way we can help you with any kind of projects in the house? Or it's just like us picking up packages and mail for neighbors down the street who are out of town. Or it's, it's us saying, hey, I saw that your house was rolled like eight times this semester. Let us know the next time that happens. And, and if we can't shoot them, we'll come help you clean up the toilet paper. But it's just an easy way to serve. That's not hard. It didn't cost much money. Just saying, hey, I'm here. Let me know how I can help you. I want to help serve you. We want to meet needs in our neighborhood. From there, it goes out to work. I don't pretend at all that the people you work with 
are not difficult. They probably say the same thing about you. But in the end, what Christ has called us to, regardless of whether we're a supervisor or a cashier or somewhere in between, is to serve selflessly and sacrificially and to have your radar kind of tuned in to the needs of the people around you. Think about what it would look like if you were known at work as the meeting needs guy or the serving girl. Who cares if that's silly? What if you were the person that everybody knew, if I ever need anything, that's who I'm going to? What would that look like in your life? What would that look like in your walk with Christ? So from work, it goes to the faith family. So we got, we got spouse and kids and neighbors and work and then faith family. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 6.10. As we have opportunity, Galatians 6.10, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. That's, that's Christian. So yes, let us do good to everyone, but let's especially have our radar tuned in to how we can meet needs in our faith family. This doesn't have to be complex, right? But let me give you an easy way to do that before you leave this room. Here's an easy way to, to meet somebody's need before you even get out of here. Before you leave, just take two minutes. Would you just encourage somebody sitting next to you? You might think, that's not meeting a need. Here's what I can promise you. Almost all of us show up here with something behind closed doors. Something we're just not going to share in this room right now. But we deeply need encouragement. All of us have a hardwired need for that. So you can easily meet a need just by saying, hey, person sitting next to you, let me just encourage you in whatever way you feel led. Why don't you invite somebody to lunch and pay for it? That's an easy way to meet a need. Just right now, today, hey, you want to grab lunch at McAllister's or whatever? I'll pay for it. It's my treat. I just, want, I just want to get to know you and do life with you. That's an easy way. Why don't you just find someone that you know is struggling in this room this morning and just say a quick 30-second prayer over them? Is that hard? Is that, is that complex? That's very simple. But it's simple acts of obedience. The Christ is in the business of blessing. So those are easy ways to serve our faith family that actually leads to the second way. So we said first way you can, you can, you can live out this kind of service is to view every, every interaction you have as an opportunity to serve. Second, here, here's the second one. You ready for this? It's really, it's really, really complicated. Would you serve? Would you just serve in our church? Would you just serve somewhere, somehow in this church? Just serve somewhere. Right? Don't, don't settle for being a spectator. Like here's what we know from 1 Corinthians 12. God has uniquely gifted and wired and crafted every person in this room who's a follower of Christ to step up and meet a need in this church. That's, that's 1 Corinthians 12. And we learn later from Galatians 5 that Christ's command on all of our lives is to serve one another. That's part of the, the body of Christ. So you know what that does? That removes from you the excuse, I don't, I don't have any gifts or skills or passions. I can't serve anybody. You absolutely can. Maybe you can't serve in some way up here that's, that's in front of people. But you can serve. You know what's true? Statistically, most churches have 20% of the people doing 80% of what the church requires to function and flourish. It's called the 80-20 rule. You heard of this? The 80-20 rule. I don't have, I don't have the, the stats to prove it, but I'm guessing that as we come out of the pandemic, it's more like 10-90. 10% of the church is doing what it takes for the church to function and flourish, while 90% of the people show up just to hear a good message and some good music. So here's my encouragement to you. As we close, first, would you encourage those in our faith family who are serving week in and week out? There, there are men and women who sacrifice a lot of time and energy and effort to invest in you and your family as you show up here Sunday in and Sunday out. So would you find somebody, whether it's kids ministry, AV, praise team, security, somebody that served you this morning and say, hey, thank you so much for doing that. I know, I know it costs you something. I know you could be doing other things. but Thank you for investing in the kingdom in that way. That's the first way I'd encourage you to serve. As you think about this, this insane idea that, that 10 to 20% of the church would do what it takes for 80 to 90% of the people to flourish, that's the first idea. That's the first way I'd encourage you. It's to find somebody to, to encourage and speak truth into this morning. Second, 
This one, this one, this one comes out of a heart of love, so please hear it that way. If, if you've been regularly attending our worship gatherings on Sunday morning, man, we're so glad you're here. I hope you've been encouraged, whether it's online or, or maybe now in person. We're so glad you're joining us week in and week out. That's amazing. Here's my encouragement, because I love you and because I want joy for you. If you've regularly been attending our worship gatherings for years, and you're not serving in any capacity, would you consider not doing that anymore? Like, would you just consider joining us and being a church where 100% of the people contribute 100% to everybody's growth and godliness? Would you join us in working and praying to, be, to, become, to become a church who's not, not 10, 20, doing 80, 90. Everybody's all in, doing all they've been gifted to do to make this, this church a, a godly, Christ-centered, flourishing body of Christ. Would you consider stepping into that? If you're going, I don't know where to start. I mean, I'd love to start. I just don't know how. Let me give you about eight ways really quickly to take that excuse off the table. Kids ministry. The most pressing need we have every week is kids ministry. And what we're doing, we're not doing daycare, right? We're trying to invest gospel truth into children of families in our church. Kids ministry, VBS is coming up next month. We need volunteers, we need help. You can see any of us about how to do that. AV ministry, praise ministry, worship ministry. Nehemiah is opening back up. They're going to need volunteers. They're going to have a work day on July 10th. Come help with that. Care ministry, hospitality, I can go on. There's a plethora of needs in our faith family. And so I'm just inviting you in to step onto the field. Because he, here's what's true. Settling for being a spectator when you know that there are needs in our faith family that God has uniquely wired you, you, to, to meet and step into a space to serve, to settle for being a spectator when you know that's the case. In the end, it just reveals that that for you, this is all about you. And when that's your posture, you're going to be really frustrated and really disappointed and really bitter. And more, the thing that burdens me, you're going to miss out on the joy of stepping onto the field and being a part of what God is doing in Forest Lake. So we just want to invite you in. Would you join us in working and praying to become a church where every member puts their yes in and serves in some capacity, however the Lord has gifted and wired you to serve? you join us in doing that? And would you join us in praying and working to become a church that serves counterculturally, sacrificially, and selflessly? That's our prayer. That's our hope. That's our dream. Would you dream with us? Would you work alongside us? Would you pray with us that the Lord make that true of this body of believers? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, this faith family and how you continually raise up men, women, children to serve, to meet needs. And we're just asking for more of it. We're asking that you would press on all of us in new ways or maybe for the first time how we can step in and use the gifts and skills you've given us to serve those in our church and those we do life with in a way that makes no sense to the culture around us, in a way that costs us something and ultimately in a way that says, your needs are more important. I want to serve you because I've been served in the cross of Jesus Christ. Make us a church that's passionate about serving one another, serving the community you placed us in, and do it in a way that makes your name really great. For those listening this morning who just don't quite understand all this gospel conversation, what is all this gospel-centered service about, would you open their eyes, open their hearts, see their need for you, and to see that you've served them in the greatest possible way by laying down your life. Give them grace to put their faith in you. Join our faith family universal and join our faith family local. That they might also step onto the field and be a part of what you're doing in and through your church. We love you. And we need you. For your beautiful name, we ask all these things. Amen. Love you, church. 